Hey guys, welcome to Better in 15. And if you were not here last week, I'd like you to see this video. So maybe you're a Christian and you're saying, well, since I'm a Christian, then God will protect me from all difficult moments. Or maybe you're thinking, well, if God is powerful, then God will stop all the difficult moments in our lives. But listen, that is a lie. That is a wrong expectation. Why? Because Jesus never promised us a pain-free life. You don't believe it? Well, just look at the life of Jesus. And let's look at the life of this guy who wrote half of the New Testament of the Bible, whose name is Paul. They didn't have, you know, a pain-free life. But yeah, we may not have a pain-free life, but we can expect that God or Jesus promises us a grace-filled life. In the middle of the pandemic, you can have wisdom, you can have God's peace, you can, you can have His strength, and you can have His love. Jesus never promised us a pain-free life, but yes, He did promise us a grace-filled life. So, we have learned that Jesus never promised us a pain-free life, but He did promise us a grace-filled life. So because of this one, we can all be brave. We don't have to be, you know, in our houses, in our pisos, you know, having the fear, oh, I don't need to go, oh, I, I can't do whatever I, I need to do because I'm afraid. You know, we can be brave because at least we can expect that God's going to give us a grace-filled life. But at the same time, you know, we don't want to say, oh, you know what? Yeah, because I'm brave, I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm just going to just do whatever I want, you know? No. Yeah, we want to be brave, but on the other hand, we want to be wise, okay? And at the same time, okay, we want to be practical. So how does this look practical during this time of pandemic? How can we be practical? Or the question is, how do we respond? How do we respond collectively as a church? If you're watching me and you're, you know, you're a member of Vida Passionada, how do we respond collectively and how do we respond individually, you know, with respect to this pandemic? Now, we are going to talk about this first. How do we respond collectively? And again, if you are a member of our church, I'm talking to you. And if you're not a member, if you're not a Christian, I still would want you still to be there because I want you to know the reason why we're going to do something, okay? So how do we respond collectively? Now, I don't know about you, but I actually did check the Bible. And I was, you know, because I was wondering, you know, the, you know, the first century believers, the first century followers of Jesus Christ, did something like this happen to them? And if, if ever, if ever, you know, a pandemic or maybe something bad happened, um, how did they respond? You know what? Yes, something happened. And here's what I would like to talk to you about. So let me give you a bit of a, of a, of a background, okay? So during that time, you know, the, the disciples, the, the Jesus followers were in Jerusalem and a persecution just broke out. So, you know, because the persecution broke out, they decided, a lot of them decided to, you know, to get out of Jerusalem and they got actually, you know, dispersed throughout all the entire region. And a lot of them went to this city called Antioch, which is in modern times right now in Turkey. Okay. So one thing you have to know, geography, okay, from Jerusalem, which is, this is, we're talking about the nation of Israel in Jerusalem to Antioch, we're talking about 500 kilometers of traveling. Now, now, can you believe this one? These Christians, these first century Jesus followers, traveled all the way to Antioch, which was 500 kilometers with no planes, with no cars, with no scooters, like Ryu always you know, uses. But they just probably used like a donkey or they just basically walked. And it seemed forever. Okay? Now, and this is where our story begins. So here's what Luke, the author of this book, tells us what happened. So he said, during this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. Again, 500 kilometers, baby. One of them named Agabus stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. Now let's pause this. When we talk about great famine, for, for some of us right now, for some of us, for all of us right now, you know, who live in this modern times, you know, when we read the word famine, probably you would think, oh, that's just basically a thing of the past. No, no, no. Listen, you got to understand this one. During that time when they mentioned great famine, everybody understood what was going to happen, that a lot of people would die because of hunger. Okay. And normally during that time, you know, when they, when they talk about a great famine, it was just something that was localized. But not this time, because this prophet predicted that this great famine was, go was coming upon the entire Roman world. And again, check your history. When we talk about the entire Roman world, okay, in other translations, they even say the whole world. Why? Because the entire Roman world was just vast. It was enormous. It was big, okay? So it wasn't a localized famine. It was going to be 
a worldwide famine. Now, maybe you're, you're thinking, ah, oh, maybe that didn't happen. Listen, the book, you know, this guy named Luke, who actually wrote the book of Acts, okay, tells us, if you, if, you know, just in case you want to check it out, that this great famine actually happened. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius. He was, a, he was an emperor of Rome at that time. Okay, so now, here's a question. Knowing, you know, knowing that this great famine would happen, so that means that, that even the Jesus followers were not going to be exempt from this famine. It would affect them. So, how did they respond? Did they ask questions like, Oh my gosh, we are in the last days. You know, Jesus is going to come back. Or did they ask probably, was this some sort of a judgment of God? Because the whole world right now is in sin. Because, you know, I, I, I don't know about you, but some people have asked me that question. You know, pastor, you know, this pandemic, you know, this, does this mean that we are on the last days? Or pastor, does this mean that God is, go, is, is actually judging the whole world? Listen, the first century believers did not ask those questions. In fact, what did they ask? How did they respond? You know, one author, his name is N.T. Wright in his book, The God and the Pandemic, describes us or describes to us how they responded. Yes, they did ask questions, but not the questions that pe these people are asking right now. And let me tell you the questions that they asked, knowing that a great famine, a worldwide famine is going, was going to occur and it would affect them. Here are the questions they asked. Who will be at risk? How can we help? And who should we send? Who will be at risk? How can we help? And who should we send? They did not waste their time asking those questions, although it may have been valid, but they asked these questions. And then, knowing that, you know, knowing that this was going to happen and knowing that these questions, you know, were, were the things that they were asking, so they decided to meet and they decided that the people that will be at risk at that time would be the believers, the people in Judea. Why? Because they were already outcast. They were one of the most, the, the, the poorest people, you know, during that time. And, you know, that they would be really be at risk. So they decided that, hey, we're going to help these people. So that's why Luke, the author of, you know, of this book, you know, uh, said this is exactly what happened after. The disciples, okay, in Antioch, look, look at this one, as each one was able, because they were not rich, okay, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in where? In Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. They did not waste time asking some questions, but they used their time, you know, doing or, or making a difference. You know, again, during this time, these people were going to be affected as well. But, you know, being Christians being liable to the law of Christ, of loving others just as, just as Jesus had loved them, they were compelled to do this. And this collectively was their response. Now, how does this affect us? Listen, if you're a member of Vida Pasionada, I want you to listen to me. How are we going to respond to this pandemic collectively? You know what? I am challenging you in the same way as the first century believers responded, I'm challenging you to respond generously by giving a donation of 20 euros each person. At least, I'm just challenging each of us, myself, you know, we're going to do this first, myself, my wife, and even my two daughters that are nine years old and 11 years old, we are going to give 20 euros each. Why? Because, listen, and you might be thinking, oh, but Mel, you know, we're not a big church to so make a difference. It's true, we're not a big church, but let me tell you this one. We do not have to be a big church to make a difference. We just need to be a church that responds to this pandemic with generosity. And by doing that, we can make a difference. So every one of us, I'm asking for 100% participation because I'm telling you this 100 participation with this one, everything or every money that we're going to get, we are going to 100% donate it to a cause that we're going to be deciding. And this is how we are going to respond collectively. Just like the first century Christians, we're not going to waste time asking these questions. We are going to use this time by acting swiftly and making a difference in our community here in Madrid. So now, so let's talk about how can we respond individually? Now, Jesus, when he was about to die, he was talking to his disciples. And here's what he said to his disciples. Right now, I'm storm-tossed, meaning like I'm so 
um, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I'm so angustiado, I'm so uh, overwhelmed, he said. And what am I going to say? Because, you know, this time he was, he was going to die. He knew he was going to die. And he knew exactly how he was going to die, which really made it more painful. He said, and what am I going to say? He's just talking about sarcastically here. Am I going to say, Father, get me out of this? Which normally is going to be our prayer, right? Every time we experience bad, thing, bad things, every time we experience some, you know, some things that are out of our control, we normally say, hey, you know, Lord, please save me out of this one. And this is exactly what he was trying to say. Am I going to say, Father, get me out of this one? No, he said, because this is why I came in the first place. Now, listen to how he reacted. Listen how to how he responded during this difficult time in his life. He said, I'm not going to say this. I'll say, Father, put your glory on display. What was Jesus saying here? His response was, during my difficult time, I'm not going to ask you to save me, but I'm going to ask you something far better. God, please, put your glory on display. And when Jesus says glory, he says what he's talking about. God, I want you to put your glory on display. I want you, I want you to show the world how during the times of difficulty in my life that you are faithful, that you are gracious, that you are loving, that you are patient, that you are all of these things, that you are perfect. Again, in the middle of my circumstances. So again, how can we respond individually? Maybe by not saying, oh, save me, save me, save me. Maybe God has a purpose for why He allowed these things to happen in our lives. But instead of responding, save me, maybe our response would be, Lord, I'm having a hard time right now. But Lord, here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to use my situation right now. I'm affected by COVID or I'm affected financially, mentally, you know, emotionally, I'm having a hard time right now, but use this time to glorify your name. I want you to use my situation so that people may see, especially the ones who do not know you, that you are faithful, that you are loving, that you are gracious, that you are patient, that you are the God whom we believe that you are in this time of pandemic. So this is how we could respond collectively and individually. Do you remember the faces, the people that I showed you last week, the people who were actually infected by COVID, even though they're Christians? You know what? I want you to watch this video. And in this video, you would see how they responded in spite of what happened to them and in spite of being Christians. May you be encouraged.